Hampton is coming to stay. I must put the word around the undergraduates not to drop in for the next few days. Why? He sounds absolute heaven. Not the sort of thing the comrades would approve of, but pure bliss all the same. I'm sure the undergraduates would adore him. It's just what I'm afraid of. Alfred would be furious. Oh dear, you do make him sound gloomy. Just moral. It's the same with Christian. Gloomy or moral, whichever you care to call it. He was full of disapproval about my lovely new present from Lord Merlin, which is what I've come to tell you about. Yes, he said he was going to call in on you. And so he did. And you'll never guess, so don't even try. He's given me the sweetest little house in Cheney Walk. Almost a doll's house it is. Full of sunshine and reflections from the river. Oh, Fanny, darling, do admit. Oh, darling, I'm so pleased. Somewhere of yours. He said not to thank him. He was only doing it to annoy the Crozigs, in which he certainly succeeded. The trouble is, he also annoyed Christian. Oh, don't tell me Christian's jealous. No, but he does not approve of private property. But he's got a flat. A flat's all right, because it's what all the workers in Russia have. The point is, he says that while I've got his flat to live in, I should not be permitted to own a house. So, with great difficulty, I've persuaded him that we should give up the flat and move into the house instead. I think he really wanted to give it to the comrades as a kind of dos <laughs> Excuse me. Oh, Fanny, darling, there's been the most dreadful telephone call from Sonia. It seems they've caught her stealing the nurse's breakfast. You said she'd cheat. Now, now, don't be heartless, Fanny. Do imagine. No dinner, then half a gill of turnip juice at midnight. And then, my dear, woken up by the smell of kippers. So, naturally, the poor darling sneaked out and pinched one. And they caught her with it under a nighty. Greedy old monster. It serves her right. Now, don't be vindictive, dear. What happened? Oh, now, that's the really awful part. It seems they've given her the sack and one has to go immediately and collect her. I mean, after only five days, the disgrace of it. But, Cedric, you are coming to stay. Oh, Fanny, darling, the wretchedness of it, I can't. Oh, Cedric, I was so looking forward to it, all the gossip. I know, I know, but I've simply got to send her somewhere to get rid of all those kilos and kilos. I mean, I've got to get her up to scratch, or rather down to scratch, for this Venetian ball we're giving. This what you're giving? Venetian ball, darling. Sonia and I are going to utterly transform the hall of her London house into a scene from olden Venice. And one will be arranging tableau vivant and so on, so you see, I must get her legs at least down to size. Yes, I do see the problem. I had rather thought of Baden-Baden, though all those Germans goose-stepping all over the place might just overexcite one. Anyway, I must be off absolutely at once to pick up Erin Dante. Goodbye, Cedric. I hope they haven't locked her up. <laughs> Bye. Thank you, darling. There isn't going to be any wedding breakfast because Christian has something on with the comrades. But you will come and see us soon in Cheney Walk. Are you going anywhere at all? Oh, dear, no. It's very kind of Christian to marry me at all. I can't expect any more bourgeois concessions. I just thought that you... Well, that both of you might enjoy a little fun. Fun, Fanny, darling. Whatever are you thinking of when Christian and the comrades have so much to worry them? Take a benzina. She's positively flooded her cabaret. <laughs> I guess what you are, 
care if you're a guest while I am. Right. You first. The Black Death, darling. All those worms and skulls and hourglasses. Now, what am I? A superior tart. <laughs> <laughs> now, that's Veronica, if we can ever get a dry. Outside or in. Uh, I give up. I am the Adriatic Sea, dear, and soon the Doge will come to marry me ceremoniously on behalf of Venice. Oh, lucky old Doge! <laughs> yes, isn't he? But it's only ceremonious. <laughs> <laughs> on Sonia, a total success. All those dreary royalties you wanted to ask could have ruined. Well, I do see that you're right, Cedric, but I did just wish we could have asked the Infanta Dolorosa. Poor little thing. Poor little nothing. The woman is a walking penance. Oh. No, royalties are only all right in Paris, because there they've been put in their place. <laughs> <laughs> baby was born a few days later. It took one look at its father, according to Uncle Matthew, and quickly died. When I went to see Polly, she simply did not seem to have noticed either its arrival or its departure. Oh, Polly, I am so sorry. Sit down, darling. What do you think of the camellias Geoffrey Paddington sent them? I thought you said he was so poor. For a duke. His father spent rather a lot on chorus ladies, you see. But of course, dukes have such lovely credit weeks since I've seen you, Fanny. I know, I'm sorry. Lady Polly. Yes, sister. Your mother. Lady Mondor has just arrived with a sort of friend. Cedric. Oh, has my husband seen her? Yes, he's with her now. Are they tearing each other's eyes out? I beg your pardon, Lady Polly. Do they seem all right, sister? Oh, yes, indeed. Mr Dugdale sent word to say, will you see her? But, of course, if you don't want to see her, Lady Polly, I can quite truthfully send word to say that you may not have another visitor today. I'll go. No, 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 Fanny, darling, you mustn't. I'm not sure I will see her, but I couldn't possibly be left alone with her. Oh, do go to the window, Fanny. Is it them? Yes, it is. And Cedric's with them. Here it is. They're all three walking through the graveyard together. And uh, they're looking at Lady Patricia's grave. Oh, but I must see Cedric. Sister, do be a darling. Go down and tell them all to come up. Now, Lady Polly, no. We mustn't overdo it. You know what Dr Simpson said? Close friends and relations only. No strangers. Cedric Hampton's a cousin. Yes, ten times removed and totally unknown to you. I suppose we must allow your mother up if you really want to see her, but certainly not a strange young man. A strange in more ways than one, if you ask me. I suppose I'd better see Mummy, or else this silly feud will go on forever. Besides, I really can't wait to see all the new things Cedric's done for her. Not quite a new figure. The old model is still apparent there. Anyway, she seems to be in a very friendly mood, laughing and chatting. Very smart in navy blue with a sailor hat. Oh, I'd die for the sailor hat. But I'd die still more for Cedric. Boy, he's being wonderful. I thought he'd been knocked groggy by your mother's appearance, but he's pretending not to notice. He's looking at Cedric all the time. They're getting on like mad. All this round poor Patricia's grave? No, they're moving off towards the garden now. When here comes Sister floating down to your mother. She's detaching her from the rest and bringing her back across the lawn. Your mother looks so happy I feel almost sentimental. You can see how she must have been missing you all this time at the bottom of her heart. Oh, nonsense. I do feel I shall be in the way. Let me escape while there's still time. On no account whatever. I can't face her alone. I'll keep up the running commentary. Well, boy's admiring Cedric's suit. Sort of coarse blue tweed. Very pretty and piped with scarlet. And now they're wandering off together. Table, dear. Much better like that. More light. Poor Patricia never had much of an eye for that kind of thing. Oh, camellias. Can I have one for Cedric's buttonhole? Oh, Paddington sent them, didn't he? 
Poor Geoffrey. I fear he's a bit peculiar. His mother, Louelia Paddington, was perfectly lovely, you know. People used to stand on chairs. So the poor little baby died. I expect it was just as well. Children are such an expense nowadays. What a pity you couldn't have come to the Venetian ball, Fanny. They all said there hadn't been such a party since the days of Robert de Montesquieu. And I can well believe it. It cost £4,000, you know. Oh, the water for the gondolas was so heavy, for one thing. Well, it shows those foreigners England isn't done for yet. I wore all my diamonds. And I gave Cedric a revolving diamond star. It goes by clockwork. And he wore it on his shoulder. <laughs> Next time I come over, I'll bring the photographs. <laughs> Mummy, I must know, what did you wear? Uh, longy. Not a very comprehensive description. A uh, costume of someone in the style of a longy painting. Cedric chose it. One of those gambling ladies in the Rodotto? No, oh, certainly not. I've always regarded gaming as highly wasteful, immoral too. I was a nobleman's attendant or a squire. With tights! <laughs> oh, mummy! <laughs> Veronica Chansley Corbett was very good as a prostitute. They were called something different in those days, some word like marzipan. <laughs> David Warbeck was tremendous. He came as the Black Death. <laughs> Such a terrible pity you girls couldn't have come. Oh, poor Patricia. Well, never mind, that's all over now. Such an excellent view of her grave from here. Oh, there's Cedric and Boy. I'm glad they're getting on so well. Boy was telling us about his book. Three Dukes, he says he's going to call it. And Cedric is very much interested because, of course, the Sicilian one, Pincio, is a friend of his. And the Duke de Sauveterre's cousin, the Baron Divto, owns the house at Chevre, which Cedric used to take every summer. So, of course, Cedric can tell Boy a great many things he never knew about them. So fascinating for them both. Whatever's the matter with you, Fanny, dear? All that jerking about. <laughs> I'm so sorry. It's my taxi arriving. I, I'm just waving to the driver. He's so sensitive he gets hurt if I keep him waiting. It's such a terrible ball, but Alfred won't let me drive myself till after the baby. Give Cedric this for me. <laughs> <laughs> Please tell Boy to organise some tea up here for Mummy and say I've got some errands for him in the village. <laughs> Polly says you're to order tea for Lady Montdor and then go upstairs and hear what she wants doing. Oh, well, we'll be in touch then. Tomorrow, I have a great deal more to tell you about Pincio. It's the ancestor I'm really writing about, not our Pincio. My dear, when you get to the bottom of it all, you won't be able to tell them apart. <laughs> oh, well, uh, then. Eh? Un petit coup de téléphone. About 11? Oh. Uh, Eleven. Aunt Sonia sends you this buttonhole. Mm. Polly burns to see you, but that odious sister wouldn't allow it. Oh, well, I've had a very nice time down here. He loves me. He loves me not. Oh, Cedric, do be careful. And what about the furniture polisher? Utilitarian rather than romantic. Yes, I do. Don't interrupt me. He loves me, he loves me not. He loves me, he loves me not. Oh, heaven, 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 he loves me. I may as well tell you, my darling, that the second big thing in my life has begun. Oh, Cedric. And how are you going to explain to Lady Montdor about the buttonhole? Ah, the Black Death. Lady Montdor said you were very convincing. <laughs> Not as convincing as Veronica Chadsley Corbett playing the court is there. Davy's life has been one long round of pleasure lately. Parties, picnics, balls, balls, <laughs> picnics, parties, cruises, even trips to Hollywood. That was duty. I'll tell you what I find in Hollywood. <laughs> Thank you. 
No one's been near me in weeks, and I've hardly left the house. Mm -hmm. Poor Basil's had whooping cough. Uh, uh, you're sure it's no longer infectious? Oh, yes, yes, Davy. Well, what did you find in Hollywood? I mean, I couldn't bear to have escaped all the perils of the West, where the pox came from, you know, simply to come home and catch whooping cough from Basil. Hollywood, Davy. Well. Tell. I arrived just in time for Jessie's wedding. The whole place was full of it. Shock engagement to Carrie Goon. Not Gary Coon. Oh, I'm still not sure which, actually. But everyone was wowed, I think that's the word, by the sudden engagement of this absurd film star, a little man like a nut, to the English aristocratic rose. Wedding next morning, paper said, so I made my presence known to Jessie, and she asked me to give her away. Will they be happy? I don't know. I got the impression she'd worked quite hard talking him into the church, or rather the wedding parlour. So she made the running. Like Polly Hampton with Boy. Or Linda with Christian Talbot, if you think about it. The Ratlets are quite as determined as Polly to get the men they want. Or the women. They say Matt proposed to Sadie the first time they met. Uh, that must have been impulse rather than determination. Like what sent little Matt off to Spain. There's still no news of him, I'm afraid. Hmm. Oh, come you home of Sunday when Ludlow streets are still and Ludlow bells are ringing or vale and field and hill. Or come you home of Monday when Ludlow market hums and Ludlow chimes are playing, the conquering hero comes. Come you home, a hero, or come not home at all. I'm sorry, I'm afraid I get rather sentimental about so you silly since I was one myself. Oh, there needs no apology, Davy. No, perhaps not. You know, to run off to the wars, and actually, to get there, which we must now assume he has, takes more than mere impulse. It's guts. What his father's got. What all the Ratlets have got. Funnily enough, come to think of it, what Sonia montor has got. And certainly Cedric, to put up with her at close quarters all the time. Cedric is showing signs of being unfaithful. Mm -hmm. He's confessed to me that he's taken a fancy to boy. Don't tell me. He's going to desert the old woman for boy, as Polly did. And boy did for Polly. Just about Slayer. If I know my Cedric, he'll think of something cleverer than that. Hampton and the title he must have when Lord Montdor dies, but not necessarily the money or the movables, as we well know. And Cedric is hardly one to throw away a fortune. And for boy Dugdale, of all people. Polly did. And most of these are from the famous Galang's Left Book Club. Isn't there going to be one by George Orwell about Spain? There was going to be, darling, only Victor Galang's didn't quite like what Orwell had to say about some of the comrades. Less than flattering, it seems, about the way they carried on. Doesn't Galang's believe Orwell? I don't think, darling, that's quite the point at issue. Well, I'm glad you've got as far as realising that. You know, Linda, I'm rather surprised at you having anything to do with this. Please don't be cross. I'm only helping out. It's really run by a comrade called Boris. He's a terrific hon, only he does like to get drunk from Thursday afternoon, Thursday's early closing, until Monday morning. So I'm sort of standing in every week until he's sober. Of course, the money will be handy. But I'd sooner be at home, really. I'm sure the comrades are making a terrible mess of Cheney Walk. And what's Christian doing in the middle of all this? Just at the moment, he's writing a book on famine. Goodness, it's sad. And there's this dear little Chinese comrade who comes and tells him what famine is like. You never saw such a fat little man in your life. <laughs> I may seem to laugh at the comrades, but at least one does know they are doing good and not harm, and not living on other people's slavery like Celeste Krozig. 
And they're all tremendous horns, and I love them like anything. Even if I do wish they were a little more fond of chatting and less sad and earnest and down on everybody else. And, of course, being a conservative is far more restful and agreeable. But one must remember that it is bad and not good. Mm. Linda, dear, you do realise that Fanny and I have been here for nearly half an hour and you've not had a single customer. Oh, dear, haven't I? Now... Let us grant, for the sake of argument, that capitalism is bad. Even so, surely the comrades do want to make a profit from this shop in order to promote the good. Well, I think what they want to do really is to convert people. But, well, yes, Christian says some money would be so useful to help the comrades in Spain and places. Yes, well, I've no wish to help the comrades in Spain or anywhere else, but out of love for you, dear Linda, I'm going to offer you and Boris a little hint. Goody, goody, How very kind of boy. I do hope he remembers one, but then, of course, one isn't a lifelong friend like you, Aunt Sonia. <laughs> darling Sonia, with best love from Boy and Polly. Oh, the darlings, how very sweet and tactful. Now, the thing is, Aunt Sonia, darling, what Polly and Boy need is a lovely, lovely treat. Well, I've forgiven them both, more or less, but it's early days to talk of treats. Now, don't be mean, darling. After all that horror about the poor baby dying and her being so ill and boy and such torture about all that and getting the book out, surely you don't grudge them a little pleasure. Not if they can pay for it. That is not being kind, Aunt Sonia, and if you go on like this, I shall have to send you back to that place again. Oh, Cedric, please not. Oh, please. Only if you are unkind or too greedy because it is being unkind to one after all one's trouble with you. Now, Treat for Polly and Boy. Let me see. Ah, I have it. A trip to the Chateau of the Loire, madly appropriate for Boy, and then on to the Pyrenees and Riviera for pure pleasure. Oh, do say yes, Aunt Sonia, and we can ring them straight away and ask them. If I say yes, can I have another chockey? And now for rather an amusing tease. There. You can always say it's an attack on the aristocracy. It's so boring, it's enough to put anyone off them. So, one thing we know. Little Matt's fighting on the side of the Reds. At least Linda will be pleased. And I don't mind as much as you might think. They're brave boys, those Reds. And they've had the sense to knock off a lot of bloody monks and nuns and priests, all those Roman Catholic sewers. So I think it's a pity to fight in a second-class war when there'll soon be a first-class one available. Do you really think so? Soon. Quite soon now. Fort William thinks so, too. Had a letter from Louisa this morning. Meanwhile, I suppose you can say the little Matt's keeping his hand in. So now the thing we know is that he's finished his course of training, what there was of it, and expects to be sent to the front any minute. I'm afraid, Fanny. I'm very much afraid from what I hear. His size is going to get the worst of it. Technic fire scare, medical chest, much smarter than silly old David's. Our Lady Montour's four cases, the Asprey ones in suede, and her leadership, Molyneux hat box. One's three cases with one's initials in onyx and one's manicure set in crocodile hide. The Dugdale's two cases. Woo! Limitation leather, dear. Not too bad. <laughs> we'll get you something to blue chic in Paris or toes. Ah, such a pity Polly wouldn't come. But it does mean much more lovely room for all our heavenly things. <laughs> I know more abroad for Polly. She does not have her. She hates it, Sicily. She won't be lonely without us. Oh, she likes it as silky. She'll go across to Alchemy a lot. She loves Matthew and Sadie. Hello. Mm -hmm. En voiture. Ladies and 
gentlemen. There has been a letter. Uh, <clears throat> Dear Comrade Boris, we note that during the last four weeks, the takings from the People's Bookshop in Hampstead have increased by over 1,000%. Our sincere and comradely thanks are due to you and to Comrade Linda Talbot. I enclose two medals of commendation for you both to wear whilst engaged in your share of the great task. Power to the workers by hand and brain. Yours under Lenin, Lalogy Wretch. <laughs> Comrade Linda, it is now my pleasure and privilege to present you on behalf of the grateful proletariat and its representatives here assembled with this emblem of their esteem. But such a squalid object will never do. <laughs> By some happy chance... Uh. Of course, I didn't dare tell Christian. I put it in the bank. I really ought to sell it for the comrades. It's yours. You keep it. When I think of all the things they need money for, to help the families of comrades in prison or exile, and all the poor people in the new refugee camps. There's a camp Christian may be going to to try and make things more bearable in the south of France. South of France? Isn't that where those foul frogs display their beastly bodies on beaches? Odd place for a refugee camp. Not the Riviera, far. Perpignan, for the Spaniards who escape over the Pyrenees. I wish, I wish, I wish we could hear news of little Matt and Bob. Slightly better than hands, hands or what, but, but abroad is unutterably bloody and foreign as a fiend's. I'm immensely looking forward to it and to seeing Christian again. Got your ticket, passport, money? I know I've got my money. It's sewn into my stave. Farang and begged me to, and I must say it did seem quite an idea. Why aren't you coming? I do feel so terrified. Think of sleeping on the train all alone. Perhaps you won't be alone. Foreigners are, I believe, greatly given to rape. That would be nice, so long as they didn't find my stays. Goodbye, darling. Do think of me. explain that I didn't see her again for many months. But afterwards, as you shall see, we spent a long, quiet time together, during which she told it all to me, over and over again. the journey was an enchantment to her. The fields of Picardy, the steamy, garlic-smelling heat of the French train, the delicious food, the porters in their blue overalls, and then at last the umbrella pines that announce the South. bother to meet her at Perpignan, so she had to find her own way to the camp. He always assumed that people could look after themselves, unless they told him they couldn't. Whereupon, except in the case of destitute, coloured, oppressed, leprous or otherwise uninviting strangers, he would take absolutely no notice.
Christian was interested only in mass wretchedness. Rotten journey. You look absolutely awful. Well, this is Robert Parker. How do you do? It's nice to see a new face. Thank you. <laughs> well, do sit down. I'll get you a drink. Well, you've come at an exciting time. We've raised the funds, we've chartered a ship. We're making plans for sending 6,000 Spaniards to Mexico. Now, since no Spaniard will move without his entire family, they've all got to be reunited from camps all over the place and assembled here, convenient for the port it's set. You must give me some work to do. Yes, there's masses of it. Can you speak Spanish? No. Well, you'll soon pick it up. I'm quite sure I shan't. <laughs> what do you know about welfare work? Oh, dear. How hopeless I seem to be. Nothing, I'm afraid. Lavender will find her a job. Lavender? A girl called Lavender Davis. No, I know her quite well. She used to live near Alchemy. That's it. She's searching you. I'd forgotten. She used to breed badgers. I always wanted a baby one. Well, she does something a lot more useful now. She's really with the Quakers, but she's a tremendous help to us, too. I don't know what we do without Lavender. There's absolutely nothing she doesn't know about calories and disinfectants and nappies. She seems to be a trained midwife. And she's the hardest worker in the world. Now, oh, where is she? I thought she was joining us for dinner. There's been a nasty fight in Block 7. She's helping to mop up the blood. Well, why didn't you tell me before? I was going to help her. They're a very rough lot in Block 7. She's all right. Randolph's with her. No, no, she'll need my help. You stay and have dinner with Linda. I'll bring Lavender back later. Oh, dear. On my first evening. One of the things Christian is trying to do is get the refugees out of camps and prisons. They're destitute. Where else can they go? In some cases, they can be lent money. Or given railway tickets. So that they can join relations in France or French Morocco. A lot of them seem to be waiting. Most of them wait all day. Only to be told there is no hope for them. What do they do then? They apologise for having been a nuisance. So politely, it breaks your bloody heart. And then they withdraw. Back to the refugee camp. This is where they get their food. Not very good, I'm afraid. Best we can do. And this is where we work. Come inside. do anything, they're left to rot behind barbed wire. And don't simply blame the French. What are they to do with tens of thousands of uninvited Spaniards? Anyway, one of our jobs is to make a new life for them. Talk about bricks without straw. But we have positively got this ship, which will be taking several thousands to Mexico, and that'll certainly ease the problem. 
And here's where you come in, Linda. There's a job simply crying out for you. You can arrange the accommodation on the ship. Oh, thank you, Lavender. Not at all. And it's absolutely super to see you again after all this time. Now, let's see. Uh, you can have that table over there. Whoops, there's Christian. I must rush. Ready, Lavender? Yes. Lavender's found me a job, arranging the accommodation on your ship. Oh, good. But how exactly do I set about it? Won't somebody please explain? Well, Robert will show you. Come on, Lavender. Bye. You can have that table. You can have that table. I'm so sorry. And this chair. What delicious scent you have. Après Londe. I thought so. Now, here is a map of the ship. Best cabins, not such good cabins, lousy cabins and batten down under the hatches. And here is a list of the families we're going. All you have to do is allocate each family its cabin. How do I decide who gets decent cabins and who gets battened? Very tricky, I'd say. Not really. The point is, it's a democratic ship run on Republican principles. The class doesn't come into it. I should give decent cabins to families with young children or babies. It doesn't give their ages. How am I to know there are babies? Easy answer, for once. Before the Civil War, they were mostly called either after saints or after episodes in the life of the Virgin, uh, Annunciacion, Asuncion, and so on. Since the war, they've been called Carlos, after Karl Marx, or else after some piece of jargon like Solidaridad. So if a person's called Carlos or Libertad or Proletariat, you know he's under three. How brightly ingenious of you. But there is one nasty complication. Spanish husbands and wives do not share a surname. So in the case of large families with grannies and daughters-in-law and whatever, it is not at all easy to know who is married to whom. Best cabin. Said. I should just about do it. That Christian fellow of yours told me you were here. What are you doing here? Your war's over. Yes. Lost. But you're lucky. Unlike these poor people, you still have a home and a country to go to. Why not go back to England? I'm an officer, you see. I must stay with the boys. Does Mummy know you're all right? I sent a letter. She wouldn't have had it yet. I only got here yesterday. I met Christian this afternoon. Funny, he didn't tell me. But then I haven't seen him since this morning. He seemed very busy and the arrival of my lot didn't help. Lavender Davis was with him. She was very efficient at de-lousing. 
Come on. Let's go out and have some supper. You're so thin. Oh, no. I, I must have it back there with the rest. Well, is there anything I can get for you? Thrillers and cigarettes? I'll see some long days ahead. Yes, of course. Good night. Night. Now that we've found Matt, I think we should see that he gets home. Well, that's up to him. He can come and go as he pleases. Unlike most of these poor devils. He stays because he thinks it right. The bless you, Bleach. He thinks it right, Christian. Then why do you want him to go home? People say there's going to be a war. A really big war. A world war, Linda, yes. We should leave here before that begins. Don't worry, I'll see he gets out before then. Thank you, Christian. Oh, Lavender. She's taking me to a committee meeting to arrange the embarkation. Would you like me to come? To tell them about the allocation of the cabins? I'm getting on pretty well with it. Oh, no, no. This is about transport to the ship. Give the allocations to Robert as soon as you finish them. Embarkation go off all right. Perfect. Thank you for holding the fort. Did you work on any special plan when you were arranging the cabins, or how did you do it? Why, was it all right? It was <laughs> excellent. Everybody had a place and made for it. But we wondered what you went by when you allocated the good cabins. I simply gave the best cabins to the people who had Labrador on their card, because I had one when I was little. I remember her. Oh, do you, Lavender? <laughs> I adored her. She was called Labby. Then all is now explained. Labrador. Labrador in Spanish happens to mean labourer. <laughs> <laughs> so under your splendidly democratic scheme, the peasants all found themselves in luxury while the intellectuals were battened. That'll teach them not to be so clever. <laughs> Darling, presents from home, a parcel of shirts from Mummy, and vitamin pills from Davy Warbeck. I don't think my chaps would understand vitamin pills. How many shirts? Six. That's uh, one amongst every five of them. Why, well, they can draw lots. Matt, Mummy did send them for you. I have two shirts already, Linda. Oh, well. I'll put them here so you don't forget. mind. I think I must go to bed. Too much sun. Yes, you don't look too good. Can I help? No, I'll be all right if I just go to bed. Of course. Pity, though. I shan't be seeing you for a while, you see. My lot are being moved to a camp in the Camargue tomorrow. Sudden thing. See you when it's all over, then. Yes, when it's all over. It's one of those things which have to be done at once. So I'm off now, Christian, before you get back. I haven't much money, but I've got my return ticket, so don't worry about me. Look after little Matt if you can. He's being sent to a place in the Carmarg. And see he gets the shirts which Mummy sent. 
he forgot them just now. I think you will be very happy with lavender. Premier service, madame. I once went on one which had a hairdresser shop and a famous Parisian tart installed for the season. She was called La Pepe, I remember. La Pepe? After one of her specialities. <laughs> oh dear, so sad to be moving north again. But home sweet home, my dears, lovely Hampton and delicious silken with Polly on the doorstep. So Linda had burned her boats and arrived in Paris for the first time on her way back to London. She hoped that she had the taxi fare from the Gare d'Austerlitz to the Gare du Nord. Combien? It's all second for madame. Les bagages, s'il vous plaît. Vous savez, les bagages? Good. Vous portez les bagages, vous m'aimez. Good, sir. Good, sir. Alors, Madame Lavender, aujourd'hui c'est le France, n'est-ce pas? Alors. Only one day out of date. Alors. 